these are solitary bees, and they're only there to, together for my convenience. So the, the birds figure it out. So birds and bees are not good companions, if you want to have any bees. The bumblebees and the mason bees that I showed you earlier, they're way better pollinators because they don't have baskets. The honeybees are very um, fastidious and they stick things in their little baskets on their legs and the pollen stays in there. These bees, they just put it on their hair and so they go from flower to flower and, and they're messy and the, the pollen goes everywhere. And so they're like a hundred times better pollinator than a honeybee. You don't get honey, but you get fruit. Look at all that fruit. Hi, I'm Terry Alloway. I am a University of California Master Gardener and have been for at least 20 years and also been doing permaculture for quite a number of years. Uh, I also am a permaculture design consultant and um, have a nursery. I grow milkweed, I grow native plants, and I have an organic farm. I've been doing this for a while. The best place to store water is in the ground. So the, the most expensive way to store water is in containers above the ground. So like, you know, a big water tank per gallon, the most, that's the most expensive way to store water. The cheapest way is underground, and I don't mean in a tank, I mean in the soil for where the plants can get it. So if you're harvesting your rainwater and keeping your water from leaving your property, over the years your water table raises and then your plant roots can get to that. And that's the idea, is you keep putting that water back into the soil, rather than draining it away, rather than putting it in a culvert, you know, running it out in the street, whatever. And your water table then raises, and your plants can access that, you don't need water. I hand water when I need to, but mostly I just mulch. I mulch very heavily on the plant, not so much on the path, although the path is maybe a couple of inches but around the plant I keep packing in, and this is rice straw. So it's a great mulch for annual plants because it doesn't seed. That all gets chopped and then you just leave it down. These are oats that I've, that almost went to seed, didn't, almost didn't get to them in time, and then I just leave them here and it's a, it's a mulch, but the plant's roots are still in the ground, so they're still growing. So you get the double mulch of the plants and then the roots are keeping everything moist, and so the ground is covered, and this doesn't need to be watered. They've taken out most of it, and it's just the bulls over the winter. Five gallon size, so I had to dig a whole bunch of five gallon holes. That was fun, but it's a one-time thing, and now, uh, and you have to put them above ground a little bit because the critters will go, you know, will walk over ground. But I've got all this asparagus here, and hopefully, I'll have asparagus for as long as the as the as the wire lasts in the ground. But they're not going to eat. So a cloche is um, a glass. They, originally, the French market gardens of the 18 and 1900s around Paris, um, they used big glass bells that they would put over plants just to keep them so they could grow plants. Um, they could give us an early start and protect things in when it frosted and keep them from freezing. So that's what this does. It, it's got a hole in it and they had, they had glass bells without holes, but now we figured out it's better if you put a hole in it. You could also use, you know, like a, a milk, a gallon milk container with the bottom cut out and take the cap off. It's another kind of closure, although they tend to blow away. So you need to put like a stake in it. This one I don't have to worry about. A lot of things, a lot of birds key in on red, so grow berries that aren't red. Orange raspberries, or like over here, these are pine berries, which are white with red seeds, but they can't see that they're ripe. These are ripe. There's, there's nothing eating them. But you can see these are beautiful. I don't have to protect these. This is a good one too. Try that. That's more of a strawberry taste. Because the red strawberries, I have to cover. Because the birds will eat them. These ones I don't have to cover. We have some big slugs here. So the banana slugs 
will nibble on things occasionally, but mostly they eat dead stuff. So if you have banana slugs, that's actually a good sign that you have things that are decaying. Don't, don't salt those. Don't kill those. Don't step on them if you can avoid it. It's a big slimy mess anyway. The big brown, the English garden slugs that are brown on top and orange on the bottom, they're best dealt with, in my opinion, with a headlight and a pair of scissors. And you just go out at night and you snip them in half and you leave them where they are. They compost. It kills them instantly. We have a carnivorous snail called the moon snail. We actually have a couple of them. They're in the redwoods. They're in the forest. They're carnivorous and they also eat slugs and snails, other slugs and snails, not themselves. And if you use slug bait, any kind, even the non-toxic one, you risk killing those. So you risk shooting yourself in the foot on snail control that Mother Nature is going to provide for you. Beer traps are great, they work great, but even better, and then you don't have to waste the beer, is to use yeast and water and sugar. So just a little bit of bread yeast and a little bit of sugar, you'll catch way more slugs. And then you can drink the beer while you're watching the slugs die. Just like food rots, soil can rot. And if it is wet, then it turns anaerobic and a lot of the, um, the bad things for people and plants grow in anaerobic conditions without oxygen and which means no oxygen, anaerobic. Aerobic things is what we want, that's what's in our healthy soil. So in a bag of soil, especially a plastic bag, that gets wet, you know, and they tend to leave their stuff out, it rains, it gets wet, it's soggy, you think, oh, it's just wet. It could be spoiling and it could be not only toxic for your plants, there are people who have died from using spoiled from using spoiled soil without a mask or without gloves. It gets in the in the cuts of your hands. And it's so it's it's dangerous. It's it can be toxic. It turns out that if you have the appropriate soil biology and especially in a compost pile, and especially if you're doing it correctly, there's a lot of if ands or buts there. Uh, the, especially the mycology in uh, a good compost will, and the humic acids in a good compost will render those toxins uh, non-toxic. All the nutrients that your plants need are in the soil already. It's just getting them to the plants. So when we, when we think that we're feeding the plants, we're actually feeding the soil. So that's why there's all this uh, attention paid to making good soil. What we're doing when we're making good soil is giving a good a place for all the critters that are in the soil, the microbiology and the macrobiology, and all the you know, worms and things like that, which is the macrobiology, the big stuff, to function, and then the, they, they, t they give the nutrients to the plants. So generally I plant things together. So this is a freshly grafted last year apple tree. Who are you? You are. Winter banana. I got that at one of the workshops. And then I have fava beans, and they get big, so I put them behind the tree so, so they're not blocking. They, they serve as nitrogen fixation, so I don't fertilize anything. The plant does that. So there's, there's nodules on the, on the roots that grab nitrogen out of the air, and there's always extra. And so anything growing next to them gets the nitrogen too. And then I like rhubarb because it's a good, it, it'll grow up and it'll shade the soil. And then maybe some pollinator plants. So this happens to be bee balm, and that'll be good for the bees. And I got looks like I got a couple other volunteers in there. Oh yes, there's here's lemon balm. So this is going to be a great big bush, and I won't have to mulch it. I won't have to water because the plants are all shading the ground, and the tree's going to be really happy with its with its knees covered. And I, I try and do that everywhere. So. These are, these are a temporary um, nitrogen fixer. Over here is a permanent nitrogen fixer. This is called Gumi. And these will be red and um, sweet sour. They're excellent. I just, I'm gonna have enough to share with the birds this year. They didn't get any last year. <laughs> and it's a nitrogen fixer. Just like our alders are, it's the same bacteria. And so the roots go everywhere. And so there's an apple here where that post is. is gonna be an apple. Up there's an apple. And so the roots of this one plant are going to fertilize these fruit, fruit trees. Plants. So there's a lot of plants that naturally grow, that nature just throws around, that naturally grow in a place that will tell you a lot about your soil without having to do a soil test.
So there's some things that like to grow acid, and there's some things that like to grow alkaline. We don't see those alkaline things here because we have acid soil. Our soil can be 5.2, 5.4, that's pretty acid. That's, that's just the nat natural native soil. If you want to grow things that need uh, a higher pH, then you're going to have to do something, like growing other things and mulching. But you don't have to add, you know, a lot of the soil tests will tell you you have to add so many pounds of, of lime or so many this or so many that. You can do that, it, but it doesn't last. What lasts is the right soil biology, which is your practices are, are what either add to that or take away from that. So a longer term function is to grow the right things and do the right things like we're teaching you in this class.